Uh, biomimicry is basically looking to the natural world for inspiration for new inventions. And uh, I thought today that I would start with a nest egg. Um, and it's my last visual pun, I promise you. Um, the groups of people that we work with are designers and engineers and architects and chemists and the people who make our world. And we as biologists try to translate to them what we know about how life works, about the innovations in the natural world. And increasingly, in the last 20 years since I've been following this field, more and more and more products are coming out that are bio-inspired. So you may have heard about this, and I'm going to get to many of these uh, technologies that I think you might be interested in. But first, let me just tell you why I'm excited about talking to this group in particular. I think that you folks are agents of natural selection. And what I mean by that, if you and I walked out right now, which I wish we could, and, and hiked on the hillsides beyond the springs, and looked at some of the organisms that are really the extremophiles, the ones who are living with very, very little, and yet living very well, you would see that at work is an optimization program that's unparalleled in terms of creating upgrades to technology continually. And it's called natural selection. There's two parts of it. One is a variation. You've got to have wild ideas, which you guys have every day coming to your offices. But the more important thing is you have to have a rigorous selection criteria. And that's how life has gotten to be as amazing as it is out there, is because there's lots of great ideas, but there's a consistent criteria, and it, it wins if it supports the continuation of life. That's it, the continuation of life. And I would submit that what you sort on and the criteria you use to choose your technologies will create the world that we're going to have in 20, 30 years. You guys are creators of that world in that you select what will win, what will survive in the market. My question to you is, what do you sort on? And at this point, if, if it's just price point, um, it's probably not enough. And I think clean tech, I think we're in an amazing position to begin to do the second wave and the third wave and the fourth wave of clean tech in which we start to look not just at energy or not just at a water footprint, but we begin to ask of our technologies, those turbines, the wind, the wind turbines that you saw on the way in, we begin to ask not just how much energy can we squeeze from them, but what materials were they made out of? Were the materials locally sourced? Were the people who were putting the windmills together, were they local? What social equity play happened in that technology? What's the energy use? What's the materials use? At the end of its life, what does it get reincarnated into? What is the green chemistry play that you could look at in the, tech, in, the, in the company that you are investing in. These are, the, these are the things that you could not just sort on, because today, none of our technologies ha are completely clean. But putting an upgrade path in place is hugely important. That is, the companies that you're investing in, are they trying to source locally? Are they trying to design for disassembly? Are they trying to minimize energy during use of the product? Are they trying to use local sustainable materials and green chemistry and on and on and on? And what's the upgrade path for that? That's what evolution is. Evolution is an upgrade path. And I think that the only way, now that Obama is in and it's a new day and we all feel it, the only way we could fail is to raise the mission accomplished banner too soon. You know? 
Now, we're not going to get there, and, and the organisms out there didn't get there in a day. 3.8 billion years is a long time of R&D. But again, that evolution path was in place. So anyway, I'll stop there and just try to blow your mind with some amazing technologies. Here, let me go back here. Um, I'm going to start with ones that you'd find here, because it's important to remember that we are in a place, we're in a biome as a biologist. There's a plant there called the resurrection plant. And there's a critter there called the tardigrade, and both of them do this amazing thing where they're able to dry out and survive for months, sometimes even years, without water. And how do their cells stay intact? Well, look, the answer is a, a very special kind of sugar that they have within their cells. And Cambridge Biostability is a company that has mimicked that strategy in order to coat vaccines and put vaccines in an inert liquid and in a vial so that you no longer need to refrigerate them, which is a pretty big deal in the sense that 50% of all intended recipients of vaccines don't receive their vaccines because of a break in the cold chain, in the refrigeration chain. This takes the refrigeration chain out completely. And it's something that I think might be interesting to look at. Another lateral application might be preservatives, food preservative alternatives. Um, here's another one, desert roots. Desert roots, the, the, a, a root in the desert is basically grabbing water that does not want to be grabbed. You know, that's adhering to soil very, very strongly. Um, and they can go down to 120 atmospheres of pressure. To give you an idea of that, that would be the pressure that would raise a column of water 4,000 feet into the air. Okay, so it, it's, an, it's an amazing that, that the tubes themselves don't collapse with all of that negative pressure being, being formed. Um, there's a group at Cornell that's looking at creating a capillary action water distribution device. They're starting with microfluidics, but they want to go to all the way into a building scale water movement without pumps using capillary action and transpiration in a sense, the same way that trees work. Very, very interesting. Um, this is the thorny lizard. These guys as well, they've got an embossed belly. They've got capillary um, grooves on their belly and they're able to sit on the sand and literally just suck water up out of it where you would not see water. Um, and it all has to do with geometry. There's no chemistry involved in this. It's literally physics. It's physics. Um, the survivors have learned what it takes. And biomimicry is a, is a sort through 3.8 billion years of great clean technologies. Every organism, this organism, uh, the gecko, happens to have an amazing dry adhesive. And that's Autumn Keller. And there are many companies that are looking at replacing glues with this dry adhesive that geckos use.